here, welcome, <coughs> and here we are, all enemies of the people, or as Andrea Mitchell, <laughs> Andrea Mitchell was getting an award last night in New York for her wonderful work, and she said, we are the eyes and ears of the people. Um, uh, the audience can decide. Uh, Katie, you were plucked out of the press pen, uh, given a nickname as if you were a candidate, little Katie. Trump treated you like one. Uh, you have a number two New York Times bestseller, uh, which takes us from um, the campaign. Yeah. I like the smattering of applause. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Unbelievable. And it's an unbelievable good read, I want to tell you. Spoiler alert, Trump wins. Um, <laughs> So, little Katie, just take us briefly from uh, being in that press pen and the roar of disgust that Trump brings on you, and then the hallway outside of Morning Joe in New Hampshire. Uh, it's interesting to share that uh, nickname now with not Marco Rubio, but uh, Kim Jong-un, uh, who's also <laughs> Little Rocket Man. Um, so back in uh, June of, of 2015, and Robert, you can attest to this, uh, not many folks were taking Donald Trump as a candidate seriously. Uh, he was creating a lot of controversy, and um, NBC News dro or NBC dropped his universe from the network. Macy's was dropping him. Uh, Univision was dropping him as well. And NBC News said, "You know, we need to have a reporter covering covering Trump's campaign." And I was literally just standing around the newsroom, so they assigned me to this beat. Um, and. And it was uh, going to take six months. It was going to take six weeks. Six weeks. Tops. <laughs> because he would yeah. never release his financial yeah. information. And if he did, he wouldn't make it through the first debate. He would surely get laughed off stage. Um, everybody was, was very wrong about Donald Trump's prospects. And we got very lucky because we started taking it seriously uh, much earlier than, than anybody else did. And I would be following Donald Trump from... Um, campaign rally to campaign rally for months on end where I was the most familiar face to him in a crowd. I, it would be me and local news reporters or some, some papers and he didn't know anybody so he would walk up to me over and over and over again and we'd end up having longer conversations. Um, but the, the first time I was ever, I ever shared the same air as Donald Trump was um, the first rally I ever went to and that was June 30th of 2015. And he was just honing his greatest campaign hits, um, Mexico's are, Mexico is sending rapists, we're going to build a wall, uh, I get the biggest standing ovations of anybody, and the media is terrible. And, and lock he her suddenly, up. And, and lock, not, her, lock her up, oh, not yet, not yet, yeah. this was earlier than that. Um, and then he calls me out from the crowd, Katie, you haven't even looked up at me once. And I remember thinking, how does he know my name? Um, how does he know that I was here? And I yelled back at him, you know, I'm tweeting what you're saying. He liked that and he moved on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I became essentially the stand-in for the media. He always knew that if he looked out in that crowd and he saw the press pen back there, and when these lights are on you, you can't see anybody that's standing by those cameras. But he knew that I would be there because I was at every rally. I had been there from the beginning, so when he wanted to rail against the press, and he wanted to make it personal, he knew that he could call me out and that I would become uh, the face of it. He also didn't tend to like my reporting all that much because I was oftentimes um, fact-checking him or saying things that he didn't, he didn't think were fair. Um, and then there was that, I mean, the, I guess the moment that everyone talks about is the moment um, going into the Morning Joe set. This was also early on, it was like November 2015. And um, Donald Trump doesn't really know uh, the rules or boundaries of, of politics. Uh, he doesn't know what is appropriate and what is inappropriate. I think that's become pretty clear in, in what he tweets and what he says. Um, and in this instance, I was, uh, I just got off the set for Morning Joe. I talked about his change of tone in the debate before. Um, he seemed to like it because he walked in and immediately put his hands on my shoulders and kissed me on the cheek. Not an inappropriate thing to do among colleagues or among friends or in a social situation or family gathering, uh, but when it's somebody who's running to, to sit in the Oval Office, somebody that's running for president, doing it to a reporter who's covering his campaign, it can cross the line. And it can make me, at the very, at the very least, seem like I, uh, my reporting is not going to be fair. And I remember thinking to myself, holy S-H-I-T. What? Uh, <laughs> Nobody is going to 
<laughs> take me seriously. My bosses won't take me seriously. And hoping that the cameras didn't catch it. And as I was asking if the cameras <laughs> did indeed catch it or if they did not, um, they didn't. Uh, but I heard Donald Trump on stage, on air with Mika and Joe say, what happened to Katie Turr? She was so great, I had to kiss her. <laughs> yeah. uh, it was just, yeah. it was just, it's an example of, of, of how he did not take his candidacy, um, I don't want to say seriously because that's not the right way, but he didn't understand <coughs> the boundaries of, of political life and the boundaries between a candidate and a reporter and what the role of a free press is. I would venture to say he still has a hard time understanding that today. Right, no, he, he doesn't, he certainly, <coughs> with fake news and the enemies, he, he doesn't, Glenn, I think it's uh, probably safe to say that Donald Trump has not kissed you. Um, jo but Joe Biden has. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's another story yeah. for another day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or perhaps another presidential <laughs> run. Um, uh, Trump knows you, though, quite well, maybe from um, the Saturday Night Live parody of You in the Hat, because he watches TV, as we know. Um, and he phones you. I mean, which uh, it, it's a little bit of what happens with Katie. He rails against you, but then he embraces you, he phones you, he... he my, my context, context with uh, Trump goes back a little further, and, you know, I think it is noteworthy that a lot of people who cover him in the briefing room right now uh, have started off in tabloids in New York City. I worked for Newsday and the New York Daily News in New York, and also Bloomberg News in New York. And I was thinking about this, I may be wrong, but I think prior to covering him as a presidential candidate, my last two interactions with Donald Trump was not returning his phone calls uh, when he was pushing for an exit ramp on the West Side Highway for his development program, the thing that killed his West Side project. He was just, in the word, this used to be described, the, uh, former Mayor Ed Koch used to be described as unavoidable for comment. <laughs> <laughs> Donald Trump has taken that shtick <laughs> national. <laughs> I would say cosmic. <laughs> um, <clears throat> he's a compulsive communicator, and everything is transactional. He is. He holds grudge grudges. He ascribes moral characteristics to the way that you to, to positive and negative press. If you write something positive about him, it is immediately transformed into a moral virtue. Mm -hmm. If you write something negative about him, it is transformed into a negative moral virtue. But behind the scenes, he's wheeling and dealing. It's like you're negotiating over buying a used car with the guy. Mm -hmm. he, he wants to sell you on an idea. And more than anything else, I think people misunderstand him in, in a fundamental way. He is, at heart, not a real estate guy, not a politician, not a businessman. He is a salesman. He is what Willie Loman would have been had Willie Loman been successful. <laughs> <coughs> he, <Yeah. laughs> right? Yeah. He has that same yeah. characteristic of not only wanting to sell you the product, but every great salesman, and Donald Trump is a phenomenal salesman, maybe one of the greatest ones in the history of this country. Dale Carnegie, eat your heart out. Yeah. Um, he sells himself. That's his principal product. Yeah. I'd say Trump has the shoe shine, but not the smile. I'm, I'm struck <laughs> by, by how little Trump actually smiles. You may have seen more of it, Katie and Glenn and Bob, than I have, but there's not ever like a really joyous moment for him. Um, Bob, um, thank you for seamlessly filling the shoes of Gwen Ifill at Washington Week in Review. Thank you. We all miss it. Yeah. Great job. Uh, so bring us up to date. The, the, this morning you have a piece in the Washington Post which takes us on Air Force One. Trump's returning from Huntsville, Alabama. Um, now we know that his candidate lost. Um, it seems like Trump's hostile takeover of the Republican Party doesn't mean that he can drag a Republican incumbent across the finish line, uh, nor does he have full control of his base now that General Steve Bannon is out there uh, and his candidate won. So he's isolated, he's angry, dare I say he's low energy on this flight. It's an interesting moment for the Trump presidency. We're about <coughs> 250 days in uh, to Trump's term, and he's struggling to navigate 
Washington, but especially to navigate the party he has dominated for about two years now, the Republican Party. Uh, he, he is searching for wins, and what's so int intriguing to cover him is that he's not driven by ideology, he's not driven by the same values that have often shaped the Republican Party since Ronald Reagan's presidency. He's searching for victory, and those victories have been elusive. So far, he's been able to confirm a Supreme Court justice, but that major legislative win is out of his grasp. And, and you see him trying with the Alabama race, where he endorsed uh, Senator Luther Strange, to get the establishment of the Republican Party, the leadership of the Republican Party, to work with him to try to make some progress on the stalled objectives of health care and taxes. Uh, but the president, whose power comes from the base, has a base that identifies with him viscerally on his grievances with the culture, with the establishment, but they don't necessarily take orders from him. He remains their leader in spirit. We saw that in Alabama. They, they don't seem to be breaking away from the president, but they're breaking away from him and following him on point by point. They went with Judge Moore instead of, instead of with Senator Strange. And this has real consequences for President Trump because it, it tells us that he may still have the base with him uh, in 2018 if he chooses to run again in 2020, but the base is not going to be helpful, at least at, on every turn, in trying to get legislation through Congress. And if he wants these wins, he keeps talking about all the accomplishments he has, but if you really tally them up beyond Gorsuch, it's his executive orders, his executive authority uh, that he's bragging about, and even those actions have been challenged in the courts like we've seen with the travel ban. And so as we just evaluate this moment, we're seeing the president continue to express confidence and on Fox News and on Twitter that he's getting so much done. But Alabama was a wake-up call that he still hasn't figured out the formula he needs to be able to get the accomplishments he wants. So Katie, just yesterday, Trump was tweeting about all these accomplishments, um, the, the most of any president. It includes renaming a VA center. He counts that. Women's Entrepreneur Week, and it goes on and on in that vein, and, and, and turning back rules, uh, Obama-era rules. Um, the art of the deal, his, his, the, the salesman that Glenn speaks of, his, his, the coin of the realm for him is he can make a deal, but he hasn't made any. Um, do you see him as that's his, that's his, that's his calling card? Is he a deal maker? That is his calling card. He's been selling himself as a deal maker now for decades. Uh, he is, and Glenn, you're exactly right, he is a self promoter more than he is anything else. Uh, Jimmy Breslin would say he creates a razzle dazzle and he convinces people that he is too big, too good, too much of a genius to fail and people buy into that. Um, and, and he perpetuated that and he extended it really with his um, run on The Apprentice. And don't discount that. Uh, people on the campaign trail, supporters, would, would point to that and say, you know, Donald Trump will know who to hire. How do you know that? I've seen him on The Apprentice. His base, <laughs> you, you yeah. laugh, but yeah. it's serious. Yeah. Yeah. His base, um, I think, Bob, you're right, too. He doesn't necessarily have control of his base, but at the same time, I think his base feels like they know what he really wants, even when he is not at liberty to, to say it or to do it. I, I, his base knew that, that Judge Roy Moore was more in line with what Donald Trump would have wanted. It was Mitch McConnell and the establishment Republicans that were forcing him to endorse the incumbent Luther Strange. Um, he had that ability to convince folks uh, that they could believe whatever they wanted to believe about Donald Trump. He would take all sides of an issue. A and it's because he didn't stand for one thing in particular. And that's part of his appeal to, to people. This is a guy who can make whatever deal he's going to make. He's going to work with the Democrats. He's going to work with the Republicans. He'll find a way to convince independents. He's just going to get things done. He doesn't have a track record of doing it. I, I don't know when he's going to be able to pull something over the line, when he's going to sign some legislation. Big but here, though, I don't know if his base is going to hold him accountable for it. What they're going to do, and this is what we would see, when you, when, or what we would hear when, I, when you would talk to folks out there, um, it's everybody else's fault but Donald Trump's. It's Congress's fault. The swamp won't let him 
reform things. The media is not on his side. He could do it, but you guys want to stop it because he wants to help us and you just want to help your special interests. There was a great, a great um, anecdote, and it just exemplifies all of this from the campaign trail. Um, I talked to a man, and I said, why do you like Donald Trump? And he said, because I'm going to build the wall. I said, what if he doesn't build the wall? It's okay, I trust his judgment. Yeah. You know, on the, on the shuttle bus back to the parking lot several times, since I'm not Katie Tour, Tour I wouldn't be recognized, so all of the, the, the people would just be talking about what happened. And they had a completely forgiving... Uh, tone about anything that Trump did and often said something like, well, he'll, he'll do what I would do and I'm not always going to get it right. So completely forgiven. Um, all of your, your NBC, uh, the failing New York Times or the not failing, the, the Post, the f all the fake news is covering the Mueller investigation, which must make it harder for you to um, cover a, a fairly paranoid White House at this point. Um, they're, they're not organized enough to be operationally paranoid. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yeah. And they're, and they're actually, at most of the time, they're more pissed off with each other than they are with Mueller. I mean, the top guy <laughs> Or with you. Or with us. Yeah. You know, it's remarkable how, I mean, I think it is way overstated the hostility towards the, the press. I mean, it was really palpable early on when Spicer was going through his first set of gyrations, right? before we now have him cleaning himself up on the Emmys. But um, it, we, it, it really was, walking into that building, a very hostile environment, I would say, for the first uh, three to five months. But it has, it has hunkered down into the usual trench warfare at this point in time. And the relationship between the, the frontline press people in the White House and, and, and most media folks is, on its surface, amicable. The issue here, again, is the main problem with this White House is the truth issue. I mean. They just say things routinely that are false or, or contorted. And so the, the nutritional value of your interactions with anyone in the White House, pre-Muller, post-Muller, during Muller, mm -hmm. tend to be uh, of the junk food variety. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, just quickly, you're off Twitter. Now, this is yep. something that everyone in the White House wants Trump to get off. You've <laughs> done it. Yeah, so did I Did John Kelly get you to do it? What? I'm, I'm how, how did you I, do I take this? methadone, which is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> actually, Facebook is kind of methadone for Twitter. Yeah. Um, <coughs> um, my, my decision, and I, I will say straight out, I think my bosses are probably pretty pleased with my decision to do this. Um, I just found um, my colleague Maggie Haberman and I are going to be working on a book on the presidency. <coughs> And I, I had a realization, I took Twitter off my phone uh, probably about a month ago, and it was liberating. And I was sitting, going on Twitter, uh, trying to organize my day, this is about a week and a half ago, and I, I at around seven o'clock in the morning, making my schedule, deciding who I was gonna talk to, laying things out, and I looked up and it was nine o'clock. And what had happened is I had kind of gone off onto one of these Twitter, th I'd gotten emotional, somebody had said something nasty, and it had totally hijacked my day, and I realized at that point the this, the balance had, the balance had gotten out of whack, and I and I decided to to get rid of it. And I have to say there are some downsides to it, particularly tweeting out the good work of uh, of my colleagues and stuff. It's nice to have a platform where you have 350,000 people to broadcast this stuff yeah. to, but in general, it's yeah. been I've, I feel like yeah. I have control yeah. of my day. So your thumbs are twitching from time to time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Bob. Uh, are you still waiting for Trump to pivot? <laughs> or are any of us still waiting for that? Is it, is it possible or have we realized that the Trump of the campaign, the Trump uh, of the early White House, this, this is um, Trump uh, that, that we have? Uh, on the pivot question, I think most people are in the same space reporters are, which is his, he does pivot from time to time, turn to a different issue, turn to a different front, but he's so unreliable that he's, he's not ever going to pivot and continue in a certain direction. I mean, we see it with the bipartisan deal he cut on the debt ceiling and on the budget. There was a week of stories about the president moving in a more uh, bipartisan direction, uh, but then a few weeks later, it's the NFL, it's 
you know, these racially charged controversies about patriotism and so many other controversial issues, and Democrats are alarmed, and any kind of in inroads he made with Democrats seem to just be washed away by the president's pivot from another pivot to another place. And it's just, it's a complicated uh, time for President Trump because he, he doesn't really seem to know where he wants to go. He loves the adulation that comes with bipartisanship, uh, the news coverage of bipartisanship, but he doesn't have a core conviction that's going to keep him moving in that direction, which is why I doubt, I have doubts every time I hear President Trump's moving in a new, in a, toward a new place. Right. So, you know, he, um, adulation, yes, but he doesn't, he, he pokes a stick at a tender spot, like race relation with the NFL opening. It's not going to cut clean for him, you know. Even the owners, you know, weren't with him. Does he know, um, is any attention, good attention, is there any strategy behind this? His, his, his proponents say, this is strategic, uh, he wants these distractions, it doesn't, it doesn't bother him when the NFL takes up four days and we're not paying attention to health care or other things. And a tax, re you know, the tax bill, maybe it still detracts from that because, you know, even today there's still lots going on about the NFL. I just think back to the day after uh, Access Hollywood tape came out in October of last year. I spoke to President Trump by phone and then candidate Trump, and he said his advisors were telling him to maybe quit the race, to apologize profusely. He said, none of that. I trust my instincts and my understanding of watching television news coverage. I'm going to follow my own advice always. I've been through different things in life personally. I've been through bankruptcies with his companies. He believes he alone can decide what's best for him, and his advisors only can go so far in counseling him. And that's why uh, he just continues to make these decisions to have incendiary positions because he believes that's best. That's the way he connects with his base. So lightning round, we have seconds left. Uh, does Trump get impeached? Uh, does Trump get reelected? Um, <coughs> what, where do we go from All of here? the above. I don't know. Um, he, it, I don't know. He could get impeached. He could quit. He could not run again. He could run again and get elected. And none of it would su surprise you? No, all, I, all I, I, don't, I don't think you can predict. I think yeah. Donald Trump is um, uh, he's full of options. Glenn. <laughs> <laughs> Two things. Ditto. <laughs> And, retweet it. And, right, and retweet it. Retweet metaphorically. Right, verbally retweeted. Um, and, the, and the thing I would say is, m if Mike Pence become, somehow becomes president, I'm not saying he will, I don't think Pence has a particularly easy time. He was involved in a lot of early decision makings with Michael Flynn. So I think if that, w in the scenario where Pence becomes president, I think it's highly unlikely, but I think Pence becomes an object of significant scrutiny. So the notion that things are going to completely quiet down if okay. Pence becomes president. And Bob, bring us home. Yeah. The, the biggest asterisk in American politics is Robert Mueller, and we, we can speculate all we want, uh, but we really do not know. We just know it's very serious. If you look at the New York Times great reporting, NBC's and, and the Post, this is very serious, possible obstruction of justice, possible financial crimes, and until we really know more, we won't know the answer to your question. Okay. So watch Washington Week, buy this book, read Glenn, don't tweet him. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.